Our scripture reading this morning comes from Revelation chapter 21 and chapter 2. These are among the last chapters in the book of Revelation. And I'm not going to read to you the entire chapters, 21 and 22, but we are going to take a few pieces from that. So if you want to follow along, you can find these passages in your pew Bibles on page 259 near the very, very end of the book. So Revelation 21, and we're going to start with verses 1 through 6. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, See, the home of God is among mortals. He will dwell with them. They will be his peoples, and God himself will be with them. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. Death will be no more. Mourning and crying and pain will be no more, for the first things have passed away. And the one who is seated on the throne said, See, I am making all things new. Also he said, Write this, for these words are trustworthy and true. Then he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give water as a gift from the spring of the water of life. We're going to skip down to verses 22 through 27 at the end of this chapter and pick it up there. I saw no temple in the city, for its temple is the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb. And the city has no need of sun or moon to shine on it, for the glory of God is its light, and its lamp is the Lamb. The nations will walk by its light, and the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it. Its gates will never be shut by day, and there will be no night there. People will bring into it the glory and the honor of the nations, but nothing unclean will enter it, nor anyone who practices abomination or falsehood but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. And we're going to keep on going to chapter 22, and we'll pick up the first five verses of Revelation chapter 22. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, bright as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb through the middle of the street of the city. On either side of the river is the tree of life with its 12 kinds of fruit, producing its fruit each month. And the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. Nothing accursed will be found there any more. But the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it. And his servants will worship him. They will see his face and his name will be on their foreheads. And there will be no more night. They need no light of lamp or sun. For the Lord God will be their light. And they will reign forever and ever. Let us pray. Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Revelation chapter 21, part of which we just finished reading, is a famous description of all of the glory and riches of the world to come, the new heaven and the new earth. And so I'm reminded of the story about the man, the rich man, who, nearing the end of his own life, prayed to God and said, Lord, they say that you can't take it with you when you die. But I've worked so hard for my money. Would you consider an exception just for me? And to his surprise, God spoke to him and said, Okay, fine. You can bring one suitcase. So you better make it count. Well, on the appointed day after the man had died, when he reaches the pearly gates, exhausted from dragging this heavy suitcase behind him, St. Peter stops him at the gates and says, Hey, you mind if I take a look inside? Proudly, the man opens up his suitcase to reveal 24 shining bars of the purest gold. And St. Peter looks at the gold, looks at the street behind him entering heaven, looks back at the man and says, Really? You bought pavement? 
When I read John's description of the new heaven and the new earth in the book of Revelation, I tend to get stuck right there in the very first line. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. Wait, what? No sea? No ocean? I love the sea. I love the smell of salt water. I love sailing and sailboats and really any kind of boats. One of my proudest achievements this summer was watching my eldest son, Grady, earn his sailboat license before he earned his driver's license. I love the sea and all things related to the sea. So no sea in heaven isn't just bad news for me. What about Nemo and Dory? What about Ariel and Sebastian? What about Flipper and Shamu? I'm guessing that even though there's a river of life described in this new world, that a river might feel a little bit cramped for a 170-ton blue whale. And can you really call it heaven if there aren't any dolphins? That's not all. We read in this description later on that this new heaven and new earth will have no more night. Besides being extremely bad news for all nocturnal animals, no night and no sea means no midnight walks on the beach by the light of the moon. No more wishing on a shooting star. No more stargazing. No more campfires. No more chasing fireflies. No more breathtaking fireworks, at least not that you could see. And by the time I get to this point in the narrative, I'm beginning to be not so sure that John's vision of a new heaven and a new earth really sounds that attractive to me anymore. And of course, this is exactly the danger of being overly literal when reading the book of Revelation. Some readers are perfectly willing to interpret all of the bad things in Revelation as just symbolism. Things like the monsters, the terrors, the apocalypse, the mark of the beast. But when it comes to the good things, the streets of gold, the heavenly mansions, we want those things to be literally true in every precise detail. We also have, I think, a tendency to detach the book of Revelation from the first century context in which it was written and from the perspective of the individual who wrote it. John, the author of Revelation, tells us that he wrote this book while in exile on the island of Patmos. Patmos, as I've said before, is a small island just off the coast of modern-day Turkey, and like all islands, it's surrounded on all sides by the sea. I imagine that every long and painful day of his exile, John looked out longingly across the sea towards his beloved home, towards his people, his family, to the churches he wrote his letters to, to the place where his ministry and his life had been. And the only thing separating John from all that he loved and longed for was the sea. In John's perfect world, of course, it makes perfect sense there would be no more sea. There are other symbols and other metaphors in John's vision of the new heaven and the new earth. Verse 2, And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. Now, that's what your high school English teacher would have called a really bad mixed metaphor, right? We have a city coming down from heaven dressed up like a bride. And both of those things represent something, but we're not sure quite what and how to make of that. I do think that one of those metaphors can help us understand the other. And that's because throughout the Gospels, in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Jesus refers to himself as the bridegroom. And then in Ephesians, Corinthians, and Romans, the Apostle Paul teaches that the bride is none other than the church. We are the bride of Christ. So that holy city, the new Jerusalem that's coming down out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband, that's us. We are the new Jerusalem. Now, hold that thought for just a moment. We're going to come back to it. But first, for the past several weeks as we've been going through these chapters of Revelation, 
every time we come to something symbolic, and we can tell that it's symbolic, we've asked ourselves the question, does this refer to something in the future, or something in the present, or something in the past? And we have resisted the temptation to assume that everything in the book of Revelation is always about the future. Some of John's vision, as we've seen, is from his past, things that he has already seen and experienced. Some of John's vision is events happening right around him in his present time. And some things in this vision represent his hopes, his dreams, and fears, as well as God's hopes and dreams of fears of the future and of our choices. So here's our final exam question for the book of Revelation. I'm going to read you a passage and you tell me which one it is. Past, present, or future. Listen to the verbs. The tense of the verbs will help you. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, See, the home of God is among mortals. He will dwell with them. They will be his peoples, and God himself will be with them. What do you think? Past, present, or future? I hear some people saying future. Any votes for past or present? Okay, it's a trick question. The answer is yes. Past, present, and future. God came, past tense, to dwell among mortals at the birth of Jesus Christ. And through his work and through the work of his followers, the church was born in John's own lifetime, in John's recent past and our distant past. But then the new Jerusalem is described as coming down out of heaven. That's not only present tense, it's something called present continuous tense, and so it's ongoing. The home of God is among mortals. That's also present tense. He will dwell with them. They will be his peoples, and God himself will be with them. That's the future. So, the church is, was, and will be God's presence. God's representation on earth in the past, in the present, and in the future. We, remember, are the new Jerusalem. At the heart of this passage, there is also a challenge to the traditional, time-honored understanding of this thing that we call heaven. What is that traditional, time-honored view? Well, if you ask most people, what's heaven? They'll say that it's a place where you go after you die. It's not in this world. It's not of this world. It's perfect and constant and unchanging. Now, that's not exactly a perfect definition that captures everyone's view, but I think that's probably at least the gist of the mainstream view of what heaven is and what we mean when we say that word and when we see this word in the book of Revelation. But... If we go back 2,000 years, in the Greek of the New Testament, the word that we're translating as heaven is uranos, and it means sky, literally. The heavens above us that contain the clouds, the sun, the moon, the stars, and all of the planets. And then in the Hebrew of the Old Testament, that same word is shamayim, and it means the cosmos, everything above and beyond the earth. And that's because the ancient Hebrews and the ancient Greeks and pretty much every ancient group of people believed that God or whatever gods they worshipped literally lived where? In the sky. It was the most majestic place they could think of. And so that made a whole lot of sense. But what they didn't do, which we do, is associate the heavens with the afterlife the place you go when you die. That actually came hundreds of years after the time of Christ. The earliest Christians, as well as many first century Jews, believed something entirely different about where we go when we die. And there's a hint of that in this thing that we say every Sunday at the end of the service, the Apostles' Creed. This is one of the earliest and most ancient statements of belief of Christian people. And so it starts 
by telling us that God created the earth and the heavens, and actually it's often plural in the Old Testament when you see Shemaim, heavens, plural, and that Jesus, because Jesus was God and is God, came down from the heavens, the place where the gods lived, to the earth to be among us. And then after he dies and is raised from the dead, he goes to be with the dead. He descends to the dead. He doesn't go up to where they are. He goes down. Because in ancient Hebrew culture, what do you do with someone when they die? You bury them in the ground. So where are the dead? In Sheol, in the ground. And then Jesus ascends back into heaven, but not taking everybody with him. He just ascends by himself to heaven. And so... The idea of what then is the afterlife, what happens, are you just in the ground for all eternity? That comes in the last two lines of the Apostles' Creed. We say, I believe in the resurrection from the dead and in the life everlasting. And so the ancient people, the ancient Jewish people and the early Christians didn't believe that resurrection, that new life, would be in some other world, in some other place, or up there in the sky. They believed that the resurrection to eternal life would be right here on the earth, in the world to come, which is another way of saying in the future, a better future and a better world. Back to the book of Revelation. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. And see, here's the problem. If heaven, as an afterlife, the dwelling of God, is perfect and unchanging, then it can't pass away, and there would be no need for God to create a new one. So I think what God is saying here through John is that God creates a new sky and a new earth, for the old ones had passed away. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, remember that's us, that's the church, coming down out of heaven from God. This is symbolism, this is a metaphor. A few verses later, God says, See, I am making all things new. Both of those verses use the present continuous. The arrival of the church the new Jerusalem and God's making all things new are ongoing processes, maybe even eternal processes. Later on in Revelation, an angel takes John up to a mountain where he sees the holy city of Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God. Many people have speculated and wondering, what does that mean? Did it already come down? Is it coming down? Will we be able to see it come down? And again, taking that a little bit too literally. I don't think it's the fact that the holy city of Jerusalem is slowly coming down and taking its time and we just haven't seen it yet. I think that coming down is a permanent part of its description. It is the city always coming to us, coming among us. And that echoes Jesus' frequent teaching that the kingdom of God is where it is at hand. In other words, it's near. It's both right here and it's getting closer every day. A very common interpretation of the book of Revelation is that the world is getting worse and worse and worse, and finally it's going to be so bad that, bam, God's going to have to intervene and miraculously yank all of us out of this wretched world to some other world somewhere else, a new world, a perfect world that he created at some point in time from scratch. But you see, that's not the way I think God works. And that's also not the only way to make something new. If you've ever known someone who has turned around a bad situation or started over with a clean slate, you might have heard someone say, he's a new man, or she has turned over a new leaf. And that's how God works. God doesn't abandon the old things that he created whether it's people or bodies or the world. Instead, God works with those precious creations, transforming them and making them like new again. My interpretation of Revelation is simply this. Starting with the arrival 
of Jesus Christ, continuing with the spread of his message of love and compassion for all people. God has been and is and will continue to use his bride, his church, the new Jerusalem, to make the world a better and better place. We, of course, are not perfect. We still have a lot of work to do. And yes, I did say we have a lot of work to do, although God is the one who makes things new. And that's because throughout the story of the Bible, whenever God wants to do something, when God wants to accomplish his purposes on earth, he calls someone and works through human hands and human feet, human talents and human skills. It's the divine spark that he gives to the computer programmer as well as to the cardiologist to the teacher as well as to the truck driver, to the astronaut, to the artist, to the builder and the bartender, the poet and the pastor. All of these things together and more are the forces and the ways in which God is continually working through us to make all things new. I want to close with a true story. When I was about to graduate from seminary, and I was interviewing for the position of pastor right here at First Presbyterian Church, the chair of the search committee asked me point blank if I was going to be the kind of pastor who would leave the first time some other larger church in a bigger city came looking for a pastor. And I told her no, that I intended to stay for a long time, and I have. It's been almost 10 years since that interview. But I also told her, in the interest of honesty and transparency, that there might be one exception. If the people of Earth ever launched a mission to colonize Mars, and they happened to need a Presbyterian pastor for the expedition, I would have to give it serious consideration. Most of you by now have seen pictures of Mars taken by various machines and rovers that have explored its surface. And the surface of Mars looks familiar and yet very different. It has mountains and valleys, rock formations, dirt, sand, basically a whole lot of red earth. The sky in Mars looks different too. There are still clouds up above, but the dust in the air gives the sky a butterscotch color. At night, most of the stars would be familiar to us, but there would be two moons instead of one, and both of them smaller. Polaris, the North Star, would be far out of its place, and one new star would be visible, a bright bluish-green star that actually wouldn't be a star at all. It's the third planet from the sun. And so the first settlers on Mars will indeed experience a new Earth and new heavens. And of course, in a great irony, the sea, the ocean that once covered the surface of Mars, long ago ceased to exist, meaning that on Mars, the sea indeed is no more. For me, all of that could be a beautiful, near-perfect fulfillment of John's prophecy in Revelation. But maybe now I'm the one taking those words a little bit too literally for my own purposes. Still, if the imagery and the symbolism and the poetry found in the book of Revelation is broad enough to give hope and meaning to a first century Middle Eastern political prisoner and at the same time to a Presbyterian pastor a half a world away in the 21st century, then maybe, just maybe, this book has a remarkable staying power. Maybe this book has a message for all people in all times and all places. Yes, there are frightening things that happen in the book of Revelation and things that are mysterious that we don't understand. But that's because there are frightening things and mysterious things that we don't understand happening all of the time, all around us, in our past, in our present, and in our future. But the final word 
in Revelation, the most important one, because it happens to be the final word in the entire Bible, is a message of hope, of victory, of light overcoming darkness, and of a God who always comes back for his own. Let us pray. Lord God, there are so many things in this world to be afraid of. And yet we also know and we believe that you are in control of everything from the vastness of the universe down to every tiny molecule and atom that makes up every fiber of our being. Help us to put our trust and our confidence, our faith and our hope in you. Help us to follow where you lead and help us to lead others in our world in showing love and compassion, in living lives free from fear. Help us to come running to you and help us to go where you send us. In all things, Lord, we pray just as you taught your followers to pray together, saying, Our Father in heaven, Hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, forgive our debts as we forgive our debtors. Save us from the time of trial, and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen.